Welcome to AFSPA Talks, a production of the American Foreign Service Protective Association with Chief Operating Officer Kyle Longton. Be sure to subscribe to us on your favorite podcast channel. Enjoy the episode. Hi, and welcome to another episode of AFSPA Talks. I'm your host, Kyle Longton, and today we kick off our month-long focus on overseas care. And we get questions a lot of times from our members, new members and even long-time members, about how does this plan work overseas? Um, even more so, there are questions about how does healthcare itself work overseas? And we're happy to do our best to answer the, those questions um, over the next several weeks, including with our live event at the end of the month. So keep an eye on our social media, um, on the show notes for various episodes and so forth to find out how to join our live event at the end of the month and ask us questions about overseas care. But today we're going to kick off with a focus on what is sort of the, to borrow a phrase from our guests, the medical home for many of our members and many federal employees who are living and working overseas. Uh, That's right. Today, AFSPA talks to the Bureau of Medical Services or MED. Paula Jacob, our CEO and I, have the opportunity to act as subject matter experts and speak to new hire classes of foreign service generalists and specialists at the Department of State and um, those participants in the C3 program at USAID. And as part of that overview, we're able to share with them instances when MED provides secondary coverage when they receive care outside of the United States. We also try to leave them with the underlying truth that no matter where they are in the world, no matter how remote it might seem at that time, MED has their back. And that comes through in our interview today. Um, And to help us understand everything that MED does and how they serve um, everybody overseas under the authority of the Chief of Mission, we have Dr. Larry Padgett, the Chief Medical Officer for the Department of State. So a little bit about Dr. Padgett before we um, jump into the interview. He's a career member of the Senior Foreign Service, class of Minister Counselor, and he most recently served as the Principal Deputy Chief Medical Officer in Washington for the Department of State. In that role, he serves as the Chief Strategy Officer for the Bureau, translating intent and directives from the Chief Medical Officer and other department senior officials to tangible and constructive systems development. Dr. Padgett was instrumental in translating, formulating, and implementing worldwide medical program policies to facilitate the department's response to the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, including operationalizing the new 24-7 Medical Health Alert Response Team, or MedHeart. Dr. Padgett completed his medical school studies at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School. He then was forward deployed as a commissioned U.S. Navy flight surgeon with Marine Helicopter Squadron, HMH, 465 to Okinawa, Japan, and South Korea. After serving in the Navy, Dr. Padgett completed his family medicine residency at Scott and White Hospital in Temple, Texas, before joining the Foreign Service in 2006. Dr. Padgett was in private practice near Austin, Texas. As medical director, Dr. Padgett carries out the delegated authorities and responsibilities of the department's chief medical officer and leads the Bureau of Medical Services in supporting the department's global medical activities systems and services. And he's gonna give us just a little peek at all that he does and his team does all around the world. Uh, So without any further ado, Dr. Padgett, welcome to AFSPA Talks. Hey, thanks Kyle. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk to you guys and uh, the people who have your insurance or potentially have your insurance. That absolutely, and that's our that's our intended audience, um, and and even like you said, some of those who might potentially have us. Uh, I hope they're listening, um, and and maybe listening for months to come, because this month we're working to educate our members and and others about the experience of receiving care overseas, and we're really glad to have you here to shed some light on the role of the Bureau of Medical Services or MED, and the health units that you all have all around the globe. Um, and, and the role that they play in providing care for foreign service personnel, their families, and, and anybody else who's serving overseas under the authority of the ambassador. So let's start with some numbers. Um, Dr. Padgett, can you tell us about the workforce um, within the Bureau of Medical Services? How many staff do you have? Yeah, so Kyle, I, I may not have the biggest medical workforce um, in the world, but I do by geography. So we have 220 health units-ish around the world. And when I joined the State Department, I think we had 35 RMOs and maybe 12 psychiatrists and maybe 60 uh, nurse practitioners and PAs. But I can tell you now we have 
about 80 physicians, that's RMOs. Um, we have about 28 physician psychiatrists. The core of our workforce, the people who you know, are the key to our success overseas are our medical providers. That's our PAs and our nurse practitioners. We have about 120 of those folks. And we have some laboratorians, some laboratory scientists, which we have about 10. So over the 15 years, 16 years I've been in the department, uh, we have grown probably doubled, maybe a little bit more because, you know, we want to make sure that we provide the best primary care that we can overseas. So we have really expanded that. Uh, we may be at our uh, appropriate right sized um, force overseas, um, but we really expanded the workforce. Now, that doesn't include our the other important part of our workforce, which is our locally engaged staff. Yeah. So we have uh, nurses that are uh, in the host nation and the nation that you're serving in. We have physicians. We have a few nurse practitioners and PAs overseas, but we have probably about 1,200 um, nurses, physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs uh, in med, both direct hires, which are American providers and locally engaged staff. So pretty big workforce. Absolutely. And, and I know they're, they're providing care and support for a lot of people. Um, do you have an estimate of exactly sort of how many people that global team um, provides care for? Yeah, great question. We don't just take care of the Department of State. We take care of all official Americans overseas under the chief of mission uh, and their family members, anybody that's on the order. So our captured um, base of patients is somewhere between 60 and 75,000 lives covered overseas. So if you work for the intelligence community, the DOD in the um, Defense Attaché Office, FAA, CDC, uh, Peace Corps direct hires, not volunteers. Um, you know, we're going to be somebody who will be taking care of you. And the Department of State Med's mission is to take care of diplomats and their family overseas. Okay, so let's let's then talk about what that care looks like, if we can. So um, we've got the health units that you mentioned, and these are actual offices inside the missions um, that are staffed by medical professionals, whether it's the um, RMOs or the medical providers you talked about or locally engaged staff and members of the embassy or consulate community can go there and get care. Um, can you talk about how these health units may vary from post to post and, and what services um, somebody might receive there? Yeah, sure. And there, there are different flavors of health units. So um, some of our bigger centers, like a medevac center or a big country, you know, may have a, a physician, an RMO, an RMOP, a psychiatrist, a medical provider, a locally engaged staff physician, we may have nurses that are local nurses from the country uh, that you're posted in. We may have American nurses working in that job. So, uh, you know, in our larger post, we have a full complement of both American and locally engaged staff. There's different variations on that. We, we may have, if you're in a smaller country, you may have, especially in our African post, you may have a medical provider, which is a nurse practitioner or a PA. And, you know, they may be the best medically trained person in the country because we hire really smart medical providers. Um, and it may be that nurse practitioner PA and a staff of three or four um, nurses there. We have some posts, especially in Scandinavia and places that have good medical infrastructure that only have a, um, not only have, they have a nurse whose job is to coordinate both with the RMO, because an RMO stands for regional medical officer. So a physician like me, when I'm posted overseas, has a region we're responsible for, and that nurse in the nurse only post will coordinate both with the RMO in that region and also with the local healthcare system. So we have different flavors. They all work out well, and they're all dedicated to take care of you and your family overseas. So is it is it fair to say then, I mean, it sounds like there, there's variations, absolutely, but is it fair to say that the average health unit can, can provide you know, preventive care and address general concerns, maybe something like a cold or flu symptoms, ear infections, et cetera? So you could think of us as a well-placed family medicine office in uh, your community. So, you know, foreign service, medical providers, RMOs and RMOPs, I think of all the applicants that we take, we end up taking about 6% of people. So we're pretty selective on that. So you could think of us as a good primary care place where our job is to take care of both your acute needs, your chronic needs, your um, pre-pregnancy planning, pregnancy, pregnancy up to 34 weeks, 
Um, we take a care of 85, 90% of problems in the health unit. Sometimes we need to get you some other cares, and I'm sure you'll want to find out more about that. Got it. Okay, so failing medical practice, does that result in sort of a, a typical day for an RMO or a, a health provider at the I, sorry, I should say a medical provider at the health unit, or, or there are no typical days? Um, typical days vary, right? So when I first joined, I found out that the average caseload for me in my very first post that I would see anywhere from 8 to 12 patients a day. And I thought, coming from a practice in Austin, Texas, where I would see 25 to 35 patients a day, I thought, what are you going to do with the rest of the day? And it turns out, you know, not only are we providing primary care and patient care, direct patient care, which is one of our important missions, if not our most important mission, you know, we also advise, advise the uh, ambassador, um, the community. We also send um, things back to Washington, D.C. So there's a lot of administrative work. Um, our first duty and our primary duty is to take care of our families and employees overseas. Um, but one of the blessings of this practice is, unlike maybe a practice that I had before, is I get the opportunity to spend time with my patients. Hmm. So if you came to see me in Austin, Texas, and I had a strep throat, you know, frankly, you may only get five or eight minutes with me. Um, in these practices that we have overseas, you know, we have time to spend with our patients. Anything that you do inside the embassy at our health units is free. Um, it doesn't cost anything. It's part of the, the benefit package that you have. But when you see a nurse practitioner, a PA, a physician in our health units overseas, that all is cost free and um, is paid paid for by your government organization, uh, your bureau or department that you came from. That's right. No, no claims come to us or any other health plan. So we we appreciate the work that you do. Um, but can we talk? I, you mentioned you know sometimes you can't treat everything at the health unit, um, and sometimes you've got to seek care, and and maybe that care is not available locally. Um, is well, that so? Yeah. Some, what we try to do is we try to make sure one of the jobs that we have in med is that we um, want to make sure that people get the appropriate care. So if you're in a country where the health unit in that um, mission cannot take care of your your health needs, sometimes we refer you out to the local communities. So one of the things that our medical providers and our RMOs do is we go out and we find dentists, we stop buying obstetricians, gynecologists, neurologists, cardiologists. And we vet that and we, we look at the both the physician, uh, the medical facility, the radiologist and all that. And we determine whether or not those are appropriate to use. If you're a patient coming to see us and you need to get an MRI, you know, we would prefer, as you would, to get that in a local community if appropriate. If that, you know, the machine has not been updated, if the radiologist is, can't read um, the imaging appropriately, then what we're going to do is we're going to medevac you from the nation that you're at. Um, to one of our medevac centers. Um, but generally, most things can be taken care of in the local community. Um, anything outside the mission, anything outside our health unit will be between you and your insurance company um, um, to settle. So typically, in most places, all places, you know, like Cal's insurance has the ability to direct bill these uh, uh, insurance companies, but often you'll pay um, cash up front and get reimbursed by the insurance company. Sometimes it's like just going in the United States where you go to a hospital, they build uh, the insurance company directly and you pay the overage on that. Anything outside the mission health unit is your responsibility to pay for through your insurance. Okay. Um, and, and I think that's important for, for folks to understand. And, and we get a lot of questions with some of the new hire classes at state and USAID and others about medevacs and uh, so it's lightning round quiz time for you. Um, what are the current medevac centers? I know a lot of them had to shut down during the early days of the pandemic. I'm, I'm curious what, which centers are open right now. Yeah, so you're exactly right. Back in the pandemic, which we're not back in, we're still in the pandemic right yeah. now. Uh, we were sending a lot of care back to the United States. Um, now every one of our medevac centers are open. So for AF or Africa Bureau, you know, we have both Johannesburg, um, down in South Africa. Uh, sometimes we send people up to London. Uh, London has our largest capture area. It goes out to NEA, SCA, or you know, far out to the Middle East, maybe out to Pakistan, up to Moscow, um, over to Iceland, 
down to uh, just at sub-Saharan Africa. We also have Bangkok and Singapore, Singapore being our primary one that captures most of Asia. Um, and for WHA or Latin America and South America, we tend to send people up to Washington DC for that. Um, but those are our medevac centers. Sometimes we send people, especially if it's a critical emergency, we send people to other places um, as needed. Sometimes we send people back to the United States. Most medevacs are you get a, a airline ticket from the med unit through the, um, the HR department in the mission. You get on a regular plane and you fly to the medevac center. You go there. We have a dedicated staff that helps you navigate that kind of a care manager that helps you get to the appointments, makes appointments for you, uh, follows up on you, gives you a medical clearance to come back. Um, a couple times a year, multiple times a year, maybe a dozen, maybe two dozen, we have to send the air ambulance out to you and get you when somebody has a car accident, a kinetic injury, like a, a gunshot or some kind of trauma or heart attack. Sometimes we have to send an air ambulance out to you and then send it to the medevac center. So, when we have an emergency like that, um, we have everybody on the medical staff here in the Department of State, you know, spend all their time making sure that you get the care that you need. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can just say having been on the very, very far edges of a, a couple of those cases, I know that that you and, and your team worldwide react very quickly and, um, and get things moving and that the staff is ready there at the, the receiving medevac um, location to, to make sure that care is received quickly and, and the best care possible. Um, and I think that anybody who's covered by the med program can take some great comfort in that. Um, we, we tell the new hires that med has their back wherever they are in the world and, and that, that plays out every single day um, in what you all do. Thank you, I agree with that. And you know, we have dedicated professionals that that's what we're here for. Absolutely. Now, if I can shift maybe just a little bit uh, one of the topics that we discuss quite a bit on this podcast is behavioral health. Um, this is a need that, that doesn't stop at the water's edge. Um, people m may have continuing or even new um, behavioral health needs when they're overseas. So uh, um, are you able to share a little bit about how MED approaches these needs and behavioral health needs for um, people overseas? Yeah, so the same primary care um, team and, and psychiatry team uh, that you see in the health unit are available for all those services. I'm a family doctor. Um, I'm used to you know, treating depression, anxiety, um, the daily uh, strains and stresses that people go under. And you know, we have the ability in our health unit with our nurse practitioners, PAs, physicians, and psychiatrists, physicians, you know, you know, that should be your first stop for getting care and evaluating care. Um, you know, we're increasing our number of mental health professionals. Um, both direct hires um, so um, and civil service so we could have more availability to that. But if you're overseas, your health unit is you know the first step for that. Uh, sometimes people worry about their medical clearance for if they have mental health problems, we could show evidence and say over and over again that getting care early on is the best way to make sure that you get both healthier but also uh, preserve your work relationship and all that entails. We also have employee consultation services back here in Washington, D.C. That's a federally mandated program where if you didn't want to go see the um, Larry Padgett, Dr. Padgett, or a psychiatrist or somebody in the health unit, you know, we have the ability for you to reach back here to our employee consultation services, talk to one of our social workers, one of our psychologists, one of our psychiatrists and get care. Um, so that's a, another avenue because we really don't want to have anybody have any barriers to any kind of care, especially mental health care. You know, serving overseas is stressful. It's a new environment. Even those who have done it before, um, you know, it's always a transition. It's always stressful. It's always stressful for your family members. The employees, you know, have the ability to go into a mission, which may be the same as the last mission they're at, or maybe back in their work back in Washington, D.C. or somewhere else. It's the family members that have the biggest struggle where they're in the local community dealing with the new environments on that. The other thing is, you know, if there's any blessing out of this uh, COVID pandemic is the fact that we are using virtual medicine or telemedicine or telepsychiatry, telepsychology a lot more than we had in the past. We're recording this on a Zoom or a Teams call right now. And, you know, one of the things that State Med has done in partnership with our insurance companies and others 
is have the ability for us to reach out to other medical providers um, via a virtual platform on that. So insurance companies um, such as the one we're talking to today also have benefits where you can actually talk to a mental health professional outside the Department of State direct hires so you could reach out from that. And, you know, as the physician leading med currently, you know, I want you to get help wherever you feel like you need to get it from. That could be the health unit. That could be our uh, psychiatrist, our regional psychiatrist. That could be our employee consultation services. That could be reaching back through your insurance company to find a telehealth or telepsychiatry uh, program that works for you. You know, our bottom line is we want you to get the care that you need any way that you can do that. That's a, a fantastic overview of sort of the, all the options that are available to folks. And, and I've had the opportunity to work with um, employee consultation services, some of the, the, the folks over there um, with events for our foundation and a, a panel recently for a group at Commerce and really fantastic um, uh, services offered there. And I know they've gone in, um, logged in in the middle of the night to, to meet the needs of folks overseas. So they are available um, worldwide as well um, through those those secure online options. Um, and I stress that for, for everybody's privacy and support. Um, one of the other pieces that we hear from our members about not too regularly, but but enough that I wanted to raise it with you was about prescription drugs. Um, and not every country has approved all the drugs that are available in the United States. Um, sometimes the, the opposite is true. They may have drugs available that haven't been through the, the full approval process here. Does med have a role to play in helping people obtain prescription drugs when they're overseas? Great question, Kyle. So the first thing I would say, if, if you're in the United States and you're going overseas, is when you before you leave, make sure you have at least three months of your medications. And I think all federal um, health care plans are mandated to give you a 90 day prescription up to a year after you get overseas. But I want you to have a good stock of your medications before you go overseas. The worst thing you could do is go into the health unit. First day you meet Dr. Padgett, you say, hey, Larry, I'm out of my medication. Can you give that to me? And of course, we're going to work with you to help you get that. But I'm going to say, well, I really wish you would have brought 90 days of your medications because in the health unit, we have the ability to order medications for you through uh, um, your, your federal insurance and get you a year's worth of medications. How do we get that to you? We get you through that either through the uh, DPO, the diplomatic pouch um, or um, the other email system that we have. And, you know, sometimes it gets to you fairly rapidly within a week or two, sometimes Mail systems, especially in some of our tougher countries, may take weeks to months to get that to you. So make sure you have an adequate supply. Once you're overseas, it's a good idea to go check into the health unit, meet um, the primary care clinicians there, and make sure that they know who you are. Um, establish care and trust. Form that doctor, nurse practitioner, PA, psychiatry relationship with them. We call that established care and trust. Talk about your medical problems, just like anytime if you went to a new community, you would meet your new clinician that's there to take care of you. They could review your medical needs and they could get you uh, the medicines overseas that you need uh, given enough time. Some medications are more difficult. Um, controlled substances like ADHD medications, we have the ability to only get 90 days of those medications. So if you have a child or an adult that has ADHD, make sure that when you go overseas, you have an adequate supply before there because we have the ability to get that to you, but it takes a while for that medication to get there. The, the last category that we need to discuss is cold chain medicines. Um, they're, they're very prominent. They're a great asset. Uh, there are more and more of those, and they're, they're really wonderful drugs for rheumatological problems and other kind of problems um, that we have. Um, often those are not available in the community, and often they have to be um, sent by cold chain. Sometimes that cold chain is when you're flying overseas, you have a cooler, and you put them in the ice pack and, and send them back overseas. Uh, but, you know, I, I would encourage you to work with your insurance company before you go overseas and have a plan for you to get those medications when you're overseas. Some countries have great pharmaceutical systems, and one of the jobs of the health unit overseas is to vet the local pharmacies to make sure that they are honest brokers and have good control of medications. My very first post that I served in, we estimated that 40% of the pharmaceuticals in the local um, environment were fraudulent. So if your malaria medicine is doesn't have the malaria medicine in it and you're in 
sub-Saharan Africa that can be quite dangerous. We can work with you to tell you the, the pharmacies that we like um, and trust. Often health units um, have a small stock of acute care medications. So if you come in to see me and I diagnose you with a urinary tract infection, you know, often we'll have prescriptions available for you from the health unit free of charge to get you to treat that acute course of medication. Um, if you come in, you know, we're not going to give you your lifetime supply of your blood pressure medicines or your birth control or things like that. Your chronic medicines, we want you to get through your insurance company. Um, sometimes we have the ability to write for local prescriptions in the host nation. Um, so there's a different variations on that. So again, I would encourage you to check in with your health unit to, and read your health unit booklet that kind of goes over this to kind of get the lay of the land when you go overseas. Excellent. I, I, I've seen firsthand some situations where the, the health unit has been involved in coordinating, whether it was acute medication or in sometimes infusions for somebody at the local hospital because of a, um, a complicated genetic condition they had. And they were working with the insurance in the hospital and helped identify the very best place for it, it to happen. Um, so uh, definitely support that recommendation. Get to, get to know your local medical providers uh, when you arrive at post. And it sounds like it's also something maybe to discuss with med before going to post if, if anybody has concerns. Absolutely. Reach out to us and we'll be happy to help. Excellent. All right. Well, um, Dr. Patchen, are there any specific programs within med? I mean, we've talked very generally about sort of the day to day and, and some specific questions I had, but are there any specific programs within med that you'd like to highlight that maybe are underutilized or uh, people don't know enough about? Yeah, I mentioned the employee consultation services before. You know, I think that's a, a key program, both with our, our regional psychiatrist and our primary care clinicians in the, in, the, uh, in the field. But, you know, you should never be alone at a post. You should never suffer alone at a post. There's always help for you in very, you know, different flavors. And that flavor may be seeing Larry Paget in the health unit. It may be seeing the regional psychiatrist. You know, but, you know, the other, we want you to have different avenues to get care. In our employee consultation services, you know, we're working to expand that program. We want everybody to have access to care. Uh, it's a stressful world with a lot of bad things happening, um, and we worry about folks. And you know, as I mentioned before, I really want people not to feel that they're alone, to feel like you know, med is there to take care for you, of you and your family members, and coordinate care and get you the care that you need. And you know, if you don't have the relationship you want um, with the mental health people at po at post, you know, I want you to make sure that you know there's other avenues that you get. Um, highlighting the employee consultation services. Excellent. So I have to I have to take a moment and and give some um, compliments to your team. Whoever manages your your social media does a fantastic job because there seems to be something at least once a day, usually multiple times a day, about an ask me anything, um, an interview with uh, one of the regional medical officers or a medical provider overseas, um, photos from different recruitment events around the country and so forth. Um, so there's there's a lot happening there and people can learn about what med does and also careers within med. But if somebody's new to the foreign service or maybe they're just considering joining, do you have any advice or suggestions for them either generally as a, a foreign service um, officer yourself or as they maybe as a, specific to med um, and any considerations someone has around that? Yeah. So before you go overseas, you know, make sure you get your eyeglasses prescription done. You know, we have the ability to write for prescriptions and contacts overseas. But if you come into me in my office and you have a wrinkled prescription from three years ago, I'm going to be uh, reticent to, to fill that. Um, I always tell people to get the mammograms um, in your home leave address or the place that you're going most, most often. Nothing is more terrifying for a woman or a man in small numbers of cases to go overseas, get a mammogram, have them find something that's concerning and not have your prior mammograms and things like that. So, you know, I, my spouse, um, Allison and others, we, you know, we tend to get our dental care, our chronic um, care in the same place back in the States when we're at the place that we're going to be at fairly often. It may be where your relatives live. It may be in Washington, D.C. But make sure you, you know, you keep one foothold for those consistent exams that need to be done over a period of time um, and have the same center do that. If you're going to go to South Africa, to Juba, to China, to Beijing, 
and you have mammograms in each one of those places. You know, I get, you know, fractured care worries me um, to a certain extent. So I'd want you to get consistent care um, there the best you can. Um, but get your health care stuff done um, here in the States before you go to your first place overseas. Touch base with that. See your clinicians. Make sure you get your colonoscopies and all that, um, if possible, before if, if it's age appropriate. And the, the last thing is, um, you know, med is there to be your medical home. We're there to be your clinicians overseas. Maybe in the past when I first joined, you know, we thought of ourselves as the gap care that when you're overseas and you get your real care back in the States. That's not how we think anymore. And, you know, we want to have people see us as um, their primary care, continuity care that's responsible for you as the employee and your family members across the span of your government employees. All right. Well, b before we wrap up, um, do you have anything further that you'd like to share that perhaps we didn't get a chance to cover yet today? No, I, I value the partnership um, that we have with you um, and your uh, insurance company, Kyle. Um, we work closely with all the federal insurances and we're grateful for all that you do. Very flexible, very uh, compassionate in your cares. And uh, the partnership is something that I'm really proud of. Well, thank you very much. We, we value that as well um, with you personally, but also with your team around the world. And we get to meet many of them um, daily and, and encounter them and, and see the, the level of care that they provide um, to, to folks around the world. And we're so grateful for that partnership as well. Um, so Dr. Larry Paget, thank you for joining us today for Ask the Talks. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Thanks again to Dr. Larry Paget for joining us. To learn more about the Bureau of Medical Services, I encourage our listeners to follow them on various social media channels. MED regularly features profiles of their staff and interactive events to ask your questions about their work. This has been Ask the Talks, a production of the American Foreign Service Protective Association. All information offered in this podcast is meant to be educational. The views expressed by the hosts and guests are their own and do not necessarily represent ASPA. Should there be any discrepancy between information offered in this podcast and official plan documents for the Foreign Service Benefit Plan or the other products offered by ASPA, the policy provisions will prevail. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe to ASPA Talks to catch our next episode. Please rate and review us on your favorite podcast app and share feedback with us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn.